I wanted to introduce Chad. He's going to give you a getting started with Puppet talk. All right. Uh, my name's Chad. This talk is uh, a little bit of getting started. The first part's pretty much an ecosystem tour. So those of you who are already running Puppet, eh, it might be a little bit less interesting. Those of you who aren't, more interesting. And hopefully towards the end, we can get into the more opinionated how I do stuff uh, sort of uh, content that will be more interesting for other people. So my name's Chad. I'm an infrastructure engineer at Weeby Data. Weeby Data is a startup in San Francisco. We build a platform for our customers to do sort of customization and personalization. So like the softball example you tell your grandma is that uh, Amazon or Netflix, you like this, you like that. Like we provide sort of a framework built on top of Hadoop and HBase that lets our customers do that. Um, and as part of that, we have a pile of servers, not quite as large as the pile of servers I had when I worked at Cloudera, but um, still a pile of servers and we use Puppet to, to deal with those. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about Puppet right now, and I think Dan covered this a little bit, is that when you look at really successful open source uh, projects, um, as they get older, the core sorts of uh, so, uh, slows down in the development. And what speeds up is the ecosystem around it. So if you look at Puppet, like, okay, so 3.0 is a fairly large departure, but as we keep going, like 3.0 won't depart that much. What will depart a lot and what will rapidly grow is sort of the, the, the ecosystem around it. So whether it's um, kind of all the tools that go with it or things like PuppetDB or new ENCs or whatever it's going to be. Um, the trick here is that it's actually kind of overwhelming when you look at the entire ecosystem and you're, you want to try to find a place to start, right? So um, there's a whole bunch of, of buzzwords on this or project names and, you know, looking at this, it might be hard to say, well, you know, how do you actually get started? And I've started with Puppet twice. Um, I don't remember the first time. Uh, I remember that we picked Puppet. And then I remember we were scaling Puppet, but the, the intermediate, I just don't even remember anymore. Um, but the second time around, I had this sort of like preconceived notion of like the ways I wanted to do things. And, you know, I knew all the problems that I hit the first time around and I didn't want to hit those again. And so then there was this sort of overwhelming, like, I just want to make everything perfect, boil the ocean. Like I want, you know, DNS and Puppet before I have Puppet. Oh, sh that's, you know, so. Um, Getting started, all right, so if you haven't done anything with Puppet, download a VM or Vagrant or whatever and just play with Puppet and you know, put a file under, under management. Uh, the, the VM from Puppet Labs is a great way to start. Uh, it also has uh, an ENC on it that you can you know, sort of look around. So ENC, uh, external node classifier, GUI, uh, uh, which makes things easier. Uh, in the short term, maybe harder in the long term. Um, and then once you decide on, like, all right, Puppet looks like about the right flavor for me, uh, and you decide you're gonna start to do something with Puppet, you need to pick a distribution. Um, and uh, it's kind of odd, well, there's just Puppet, right? Well, actually, there's a lot of different ways you can get Puppet. And so uh, I'm going to suggest how that might work. It's a lot like sushi. Um, you can roll your own, right? Uh, this will be to varying degrees of quality. The more you roll your own, maybe the better you'll get at it. It might take a long time to do. Um, generally speaking, you, you don't roll a lot. You're just going to roll a little bit, right? Uh, you could go down to the Mega Mart, right? So like Safeway or Fedora or whatever and get your puppet from them, from their, from their package repos. And, you know, there's a few more flavors, yeah. You don't exactly know when it was packaged, or if it was packaged, it was packaged a while ago. Um, and on top of it, you can get some fried chicken with that. Uh, or you could actually go to a sushi joint where people who know how to make sushi work, right? So in this analogy, uh, I get my puppet from Puppet Labs. And so I'm not, when I say get puppet from Puppet Labs, I'm not just saying uh, Puppet Enterprise, right? So Puppet has two repositories, the Yum Puppet Labs and the App Puppet Labs, uh, where you can get sort of the, 
the relish or uh, Debian, Ubuntu-ish flavors of like the open source packages. And so my strong recommendation to you is to start there. Um, Puppet Enterprise is a, a whole different uh, ball of wax. I will uh, bias alert that I do run Puppet Enterprise. If you want to ask me why, you know, talk to me. Talk to me after. Um, and just so everyone knows, when I when the when we put up the slides, all these links that I'm going to talk about will be available, so you don't have to like Google around or or try to find them. Everything will be available for you later. All right, so then you have a distribution, and now uh, another choice that you have is you can potentially do some sort of external node classification. So uh, there's a couple different ways that you can describe nodes. You can use straight sort of text files and say, this is a node, and it has these classes. Or you can use an external node classifier, which is sort of a, well, you can do it GUIs, and there's other ways. Um, for getting started, this is a great way to kind of just make it easy to add classes to nodes and kind of play around. Um, for people who have run at slightly larger scales, this also can be a challenge because it can provide a bottleneck. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things to consider is who's your users. Like if you have a very narrow set of people who are ever going to deal with this and they can, you know, Emacs or Vim or Git all make sense to them, maybe this isn't as useful. If you have managers who need to add something like a user, maybe this starts to get a little bit more useful. Um, the two on these slides are actually Puppet Console, which is part of uh, Puppet Enterprise, but the open source version is called Dashboard. Um, and also Foreman, which is uh, a huge project that's very opinionated, but it has a really nice ENC. Um, Dan talked a little bit about PuppetDB. Uh, I run store configs, uh, probably not as much as some people, but I run a lot of store configs for Nodgios and Ganglia and uh, some of the other uh, packages that I run, and it makes a huge difference. Um, I also, the, the, the concepts that people are talking about, about being able to query and sort of ask questions like, show me or tell me about the IPs of everything that's a data node or a web server or whatever. Those things are kind of interesting. I haven't ruled those out yet, but like, I think that once it gets there, you're going to want to, you're going to run DB. Uh, Hira, uh, if you're in 3.0 land, uh, for sure, if you're in 2.7, uh, I, would, I would also recommend it. Uh, Dan talked a little bit about this, so I won't uh, harp on it much more. Uh, then the other thing I would consider, and so this is the uh, another bias alert, is I run in a data center. I don't do much in the way of cloud. So uh, I have bare metal and VMs, mostly bare metal. Um, so an important thing for me is, is sort of the end-to-end the -end provisioning aspect, right? Um, generally, when I get servers, I get them by the rack, and that's sort of a big deal for like rolling it out. And part of the Puppet story is how do I get everything there before Puppet? So, um, while not necessary to use Puppet, I would recommend, if you are in a similar situation, to look at your provisioning story. Um, the sort of uh, standbys are there. Cobbler, um, it's getting a lot better. Uh, Foreman, which is a very opinionated sort of end-to-end -end sort of provisioning system, which includes like DHCP and DNS and everything else. Uh, if that fits your model, then great. Um, and then uh, Razor is the sort of the new uh, fun project. Uh, I run Razor, but mostly because I am trying to develop on or trying to develop Razor. Um, it is a little more rough-edged and uh, might require a little more work on your part, but it's pretty slick. Um, so when I showed this to a friend of this slide to a friend of mine, he got really, really sort of anxious because I'm not recommending an architecture to you, a starting architecture. Um, what I am recommending is sort of the right way to start. And uh, the thing that I've noticed talking to a lot of people in, that do Puppet is that proof of concepts never die for Puppet, right? You start a proof of concept, and unless it's on your laptop, you start to do real work with it, and then it's always there. 
uh, well, we can't, no, see now, that, this is not the right time to take it down or to re-architect it. We've already got servers under management. We're like, uh, no, we need to wait for next week or next month or next year or two years from now. Um, I made this mistake the first time around, and it made my scaling challenges much, much harder. So what I am recommending to you is uh, whether you do it with bare metal or uh, VMs, is uh, don't just run everything on one node. Like break it up, uh, and uh, you know if you have, uh, you'll find that the scaling puppet masters or moving to multiple puppet masters is a lot easier when you when you can kind of tease apart what's actually happening. Um, and so about scaling, a lot of people want to know, well, how do I scale Puppet? And uh, it's kind of similar to when people ask me, well, how do I know how big of a Hadoop cluster do I need to build? Um, the answer is I can't actually tell you. Uh, because the way that your infrastructure is set up and the, what you're putting under management is much, much different than what I'm doing. And so the way things are going to scale for you is a lot different than the way things are going to scale for me. But what I can tell you is uh, how to watch for it. Right? So uh, monitoring should be a big part of your puppet infrastructure. Uh, you should be watching things like catalog, complete, or catalog compilation times and watching your puppet masters. If you're using ANCs, watching them. Um, the other way that's my recommendation to sort of scaling Puppet is to start incrementally, uh, which is just a great way to start anyway. Like put sudo under management, put users under management, and just start building up from there. It's when you try to jump all in and like boil the ocean that things get to be really complicated really fast. So uh, sort of the first part. The second part is more the interesting part, right? The, the part that uh, do I'm I mostly do engineering, uh, so this is the more interesting part for me, the, the actual times to, to write modules, but not really. Um, so before you get to modules, uh, I have a couple recommendations about how you actually manage your modules. Uh, one of which is that you manage them like you would any other piece of code, right? So uh, this is librarian, which you can think of as like gem sets or uh, any other thing like that, where you will describe in a file like all the different modules I use and what version. Um, and doing this will help you, one, just get into a place where you actually start thinking about it. And two, when your Puppet Master blows up, will make it easier for you to roll this back out. Um, the, the thing I can say, the, the, the second greatest lessons learned from doing Puppet the first time is, uh, break your modules out into individually released components. Uh, monolithic repositories of all your modules are going to be hard. If you have one user base, uh, so basically just infrastructure or operations or whoever, then maybe you can get away with it. What we found uh, at Cloudera is when we had engineering and support and sales engineering, right? they all had very different requirements. And they all wanted to be in a different place. Like, oh, we need this version of this and that version of this. When you release monolithically, then you end up getting branches. And then you start cherry picking between branches or moving patches between branches. And you're trying to remember, OK, so they're on this, and they're in this, and their environment. And it just gets to be too difficult. So break everything out. You can release kind of not in parallel, but just individually. And it will make your life a lot easier. Um, the forge should be, in my opinion, the first place you go for a module, or the first place you go to see if there is a module. Um, the, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing somebody, but the, the only thing worse than using the forge is writing everything yourself. Right? So uh, the forge is getting better. The challenge around the Forge isn't so much the Forge itself, but the fact that we now have users on two very or three very different branches um, with different features, right? So 
2.6 people, Hira not so much, 2.7 people, Hira, but Hira with the keyword 3.0, Hira without a keyword and a whole different scoping. Uh, so when you go to the forge, is your module written for 2.7? Is it written for 2.6? Is it 3.0? Uh, those will be challenges. Another challenge is, is I guarantee you're going to go to the forge. And if you're a, a Debian or Ubuntu shop or if you're a RHEL shop, you're going to go and you're going to see the perfect module that's not written for your operating system. Uh, uh, it has like a nice if def, like, oh yeah, here's the rel implementation, Ubuntu fail. Uh, and you're going to wish that that has already been done. So my recommendation is do it and then release it back to the, to the forge. Wow, I'm going really fast. The, uh, the next place to go, uh, which is where Currently, I think most people go and get most of their modules, and, and I certainly do, uh, is GitHub. Um, I think that the most interesting thing about this is that uh, you can find uh, individual users who haven't quite found the forge yet, or really big projects, sort of the, uh, the, uh, what, the example 42 guys that have the, the massive repository of all these modules that are tightly coupled. Uh, and you can, you know, if nothing else, you can just easily see how people write modules. Um, the, uh, if nothing else, you should put your modules on, if you're allowed to, right? So uh, I worked at a company where our modules weren't, weren't public and weren't allowed to be public. But uh, if you are able to, uh, and you, you know, at least get them on GitHub. But when you're on GitHub and when you're using modules from the Forge, my, my strong recommendation is don't fork just as like a knee-jerk reaction, right? Uh, if you f it's great to fork. And if you run off your fork, that's fine too. Uh, but do try to get sort of your, your modules kind of upstream back in. So, you know, if you're making a change, if you're adding support for RHEL, if you're adding support for Ubuntu, try to get those changes back. Um, that doesn't always work. Sometimes the, the author of the module or the committer uh, won't be particularly interested in the change you're making. Uh, it doesn't fit within the, the scope of the work that they think it should be doing. They don't think you should purge that directory, whatever. In those cases, like if that's really important to you, then yeah, all right, you have to fork. Um, whenever possible, though, uh, try to get stuff back in. What we don't need is 17,000 modules to do sudo, right? Like, uh, you know, if we proliferate the forge with like 17,000 modules to do sudo, that's just a lot of noise. Uh, the flip to that is, uh, I guess I should have said this on the forge, another challenge from the forge is, if you think about the way that you start to use modules, especially if you pull in, I think the, the module that I use that has the most dependencies is Razor, and Razor pulls in nine different modules, including a sudo module. Uh, so as you use modules, that dependency hell will start to creep on you, right? Like, oh, I was using this sudo, which had a totally different API than the sudo that just got sucked in from over here. So, you know, that, as these forks proliferate, that problem will just get worse. So to the extent that we can, like, reduce that as a community, right? So it's not necessarily Puppet Lab's problem. Uh, they certainly have a vested interest in helping fixing it, but as a community, like really take it on yourself to like not just go blowing out forks. Uh, you will roll your own. I guarantee it. Like you're going to write your own modules for something, uh, and that's cool. Uh, a lot of modules that you have to write for your particular infrastructure are, uh, you know, different than than what I need. Um, you know. Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, when possible, you know, go grab somebody else's module and use that. And I guess the, the next thing is, is, all right, so I know where to get modules. Uh, I may or may not know a whole lot about writing them. So where do I actually learn more about it? Well, one, you're at pub, uh, Puppet Camp, so that's a, that's a great start. Uh, Puppet Conf was not too long ago. Uh, that was a great conference. Uh, there are a bunch of books, as, as Dan pointed out. 
Um, if your company is the kind of company that will actually send you to training, uh, the training does not suck. Uh, I have gone to training. Um, and I happen to run the San Francisco Puppet Master Users Group. So I, I think that if you are you know, within driving distance of the San Francisco group, you should come. Uh, there is one down here, uh, but I prefer the San Francisco one. Uh, also, uh, if you are on IRC for something else, you should just drop into Puppet uh, and stay there. If you are interested in doing more with Puppet than just writing modules or listening to people ask, what's this esoteric error, you can drop into Puppet Dev, uh, where you can kind of see what's going on behind the, cert, uh, behind the scenes. I've actually uh, moved my knowledge more just snooping on the engineers than uh, reading documentation. Um, and the mailing list, uh, while there's a lot of traffic, filter it away, read it when you have 20 minutes instead of reading Reddit. Um, but the number one way to learn Puppet is to read Puppet modules or write Puppet modules. Um, a fantastic thing is the module of the week, which I haven't seen in a little bit, but every single time you see a module of the week, go read the module and see what it's doing. Especially modules that are doing things that are not just uh, init PP, right? So modules that have written facts or have functions. Um, but reading other people's modules, especially people who like, Puppet Labs modules, or, or Tim Sharp, or uh, Jordan Sissel, or people who, who are very active in the community can really sort of redefine how you, how you use Puppet. Uh, and then this is sort of new for me in the last about year, but Puppet has more than a DSL, right? So uh, I think that a lot of people just uh, are fine writing in the Puppet DSL and will do, try to do everything they can to stay in that space. Uh, which is fine when you are talking about a resource or you are talking about a file or, or whatever. Um, when you start doing evil stuff like this, where you write an, uh, an inner define to do a loop so that you can not create an, uh, a bunch of resources that you can just iterate over something. Um, that's evil. Uh, and this would be better served actually doing some sort of type or provider, right? Um, if you think about, like, as a new person to Puppet, like, relatively new, you know what a class is, you know what a define is. Um, had I not called that loop, you might be going, why in the world is there an inner define here? And why in the world is he doing this, right? Uh, and just to just to make modules more re readable, it's going to uh, sort of help. Um, also, uh, one, of the, one of the parts that was the, the coolest, I have a, a Hadoop module that I will open source at some time. I promise when it doesn't break my stuff, I will not break yours. Uh, that has a config file where the, I don't just use like concat to put together a bunch of XML, right? I have a backend in Ruby that actually writes linted, validated XML and does all the, all the types and, and all the settings in, in the Hadoop XML files uh, automatically, right? And what I noticed was it was a lot harder to write uh, in terms of the number of hours I needed to write that particular module. I also noticed that it created a lot less bugs when it was running uh, so that my, the, the subtle bugs that I would do because I concatted a file incorrectly or whatever I used to do when I used to build these things went away. So uh, I recommend sort of once you get used to Puppet, you know, there's these other parts. And, you know, some people, uh, you know, in this community are a little bit nervous about Ruby. Uh, it's not that bad. Just read some examples. Uh, and I guess sort of the, the last takeaway is um, if, you are in, if you're using Puppet and you haven't heard of Vagrant or you're not using Vagrant, you should use Vagrant. 
Um, and uh, for development, you know, running a, a small VM on your box, on your local laptop, that you can burn down and redo and snapshot, which is Sahara, uh, and just quickly, quickly iterate through all of these changes will make your life a lot better. Um, right now at Weeby, we have just started rolling out this sort of infrastructure which takes Jenkins, spins up Vagrant, that runs our Puppet modules, that tests, yeah, Yes, indeed, that had the effect that we wanted, right? So that this becomes more development than just sort of administration. And so that was really fast. But um, if there's any questions, I'll take them now. And if not, thank you. you talk about wait, the, wait, wait. Uh, you talk about the uh, dependency hell with uh, the various puppet modules, and, and, and one of the problems that I'm running into is I, I'm, I'm right now using mostly just templated files, and, and I'm, my, temp, my templates are just changing faster than I can really maintain, and I, I have a fear that if I go to a, a module uh, way of doing things, that I'm just going to be screwing with everyone's modules because I'm not doing things correctly, probably. But, um, so so in, in, my, in, in my configuration, I have, like, for example, SNMP configuration where I'm doing special things for certain systems that I'm not doing for other systems, like uh, using net SNMP extend. So I was using a uh, generic SNMP configuration now that it's applied to everything. Um, and, and now I'm having to back rev all that stuff into something different that now will work with the, the new things that I'm having to do. So I, I guess the question is using the, the uh, more modular methods, I, I have a fear that I'm going to have a problem with that. So. Um I think that, that what you will not have a problem. What will be hard is that when you write a module, figuring out that sort of the API, like the way that you need to use that module is the challenge. Like that, that is going to be way harder than just having a flat setup and saying, I've got these 22 files um, and they're very, very rigid and I pull these parameters, right? Like that's, a, that's just a, that's a, an unfortunate challenge, but I think the, uh, the side effect is, is that um, you sort of gain reusability. If you think about like what you're trying to do and trying to cut it into the smallest possible piece, right, that you can reuse everywhere, and then just build from that. Like, uh, you know, when you think about uh, sort of the, the, the easiest module that everyone talks about, right, because it's like the hello world of Puppet, is the NTP as an NTP module, right? So uh, the difference between a client and a server um, and also like a third version of the config. So that's sort of like config is I'm going to mess with the config files that is both for the client and the server, right? So I have three different sort of like surfaces that I touch for that module. Um, this one works for both and these two are stand, these kind of are standalone, right? So the way you, you know, the challenge is, is in like architecting and cutting up your module. Um, the dependency hell is that, you know, you want you know, version two of that module. And you want to also run this cool thing which requires version three of that module that just broke the interface that you were using. So now you have to like go back in and update something. It's just like any, like uh, I, yesterday, we, uh, we used GitHub pages for a project and we pushed this new documentation to the project and it didn't work and we couldn't figure out why and it was because GitHub had moved the Jekyll dependency, right? The same thing will happen to you in, in Puppet, if you're, especially when you're using outside modules. But inside, if you're going to write your own module, uh, you know, modules well, over it, files. It, in this scenario, I was using a, uh, a Puppet module that I pulled down, mm -hmm. and now I'm having to modify somebody else's module that I, now I'm like, okay, now I'm doing something oh. totally different, adding my own special things into their sure, module sure. that I don't necessarily want to do. So. Uh, so if you need them, then clearly there, there might be a need for them, and you might not be the only person who needs that. So uh, talk to the, the original author or the, you know, find them, submit a pull request, whatever. Um, if, you, if you're making those changes anyway, it's fairly low uh, cost for you to, to fire those changes back to them and see if they think they're interesting. Worst case, they say, thanks, but I'm not interested in that in my module. And then, yeah, 
Well, you're absolutely right to fork and like take your. I own guess in my out. situation, I can guarantee they're not interesting to anybody but me. Okay. But <laughs> well, you know what might be more interesting is a generic way to do what you're yeah. trying to do. Right. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what I was uh, more reaching for. Right. So uh, if you think about like um, and the, uh, the uh, man, I can never say that pro the project name. So Puppet has parsed file, um, and there's Augeus, whatever. Um, which lets you kind of like screw around with config files and you kind of extract away like the config file for whatever you're doing and make an easy way to just basically take a key value pair and make those changes like that will be valuable versus like I need this specific configuration for this server and this specific router right like that's not no one no one cares um, so that's that's the best advice I have oh one more So if I have a module already deployed in a production environment, and I plan to continue to enhance this module, what would be the recommended way to set up a testing environment to test this module without interrupting the production environment? Uh, so a handful of people will do it different ways. Some people will do it with environments. So environments are something you can run on, pup, on a Puppet Master. Um, I actually have a separate dev test environment which has a separate puppet master um, and so that's how I do it um, it was a lot easier when I had a lot more servers a lot harder when I have fewer um, but if you think about like the test environment can actually be really small like a bunch of VMs uh, can easily tell whether or not you put the files in the right places and you install the right packages so arbitrarily small VMs uh, in a separate environment is the way I would do it um, I'm not a huge fan of environments. Uh, I, used, I, I used them to some extent uh, with, with limited success when I was trying to support, uh, support and engineering and, and my own teams separately and that, that met with sort of limited success uh, just with the way that our infrastructure was set up. Um, so if you, can, if you can afford just do it separate then break it out. Hi, um, you said that you manage a lot of uh, a large cluster. Um, do you have a single uh, puppet master managing how many clients? Uh, uh, can you share so, that? So, uh, or do you have a puppet master farm itself? Yeah, Roman probably is a better person. Roman's coming up next. Roman works at Cloudera now, um, where I used to work when I had enough servers that it would actually have mattered, right? So right now I have a puppet master, um, and it's. Uh, my, my sort of knee-jerk reaction is uh, in, in the way that I have seen the world, the way I've seen Puppet and Puppet scaling, is if you are less than 500, and it's certainly if you're less than like 250, you don't have to worry about these problems. Like these are not problems for you. You will have other problems that bite you way harder, faster, uh, than, than scaling a Puppet Master. Uh, an ENC will totally bite you uh, at 250, uh, you know, 500 that could that could totally totally get you. But um, uh, if you look at what uh, so uh, Mozilla has 1,200 or last time they announced they had 1,200 nodes under management and they had like eight puppet masters load balanced. Um, I, and the trick is is that it's hard to say if that's a lot or a little because um, they also have 141 modules. So you know, the size of their catalogs versus, you know, the size of my catalogs are, are very different. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. Like, I use a lot of stored configs, which changes my, you know, the way that I, my scaling characteristics over if you don't use any stored configs, right? Um, and if worst case comes to worst, just run masterless and, and no stored configs and, and be happy with your life. Any other questions? Um, you said to come afterward to talk to you about this. Can you give a summary of why yeah. you chose PE? So, uh, wait, about Puppet Enterprise? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my core business is not Puppet. Um, every hour that I work on Puppet is an hour that I waste on my product. Um, so. I don't give a shit about uh, Puppet. 
It's great. It makes my life better, and that's the why I use it. Um, if it breaks, that pisses me off because now I'm delaying like all the things that I'm going to be doing. I'm going to stay up way later than I wanted to. I like to sleep, um, and so my my response is I'm happy to trade that, uh, like having a neck to choke when something breaks, uh, having somebody support and kind of back me up. Uh, you know, uh, if my production cluster goes down and it's a puppet issue or something fell over, like having a phone to call, like that's important to me. Um, I am an ops team of one at my company. We're 20 people. Um, and so, you know, I also worked at Cloudera, which has a very similar mechanic. So I, I sort of have bought into that. If you are in a place where that's important to you, then I would say that's great. If uh, you're in a place where you know your company over their dead body, you'll be fine on on open source Puppet as well. But uh, yeah, Puppet's not my core business. Is is my one second answer to that? Anybody else? You guys are great, taking up all my time so I don't have to talk. Yeah, I live in San Francisco. Do you know how early I had to get up to get down here? <laughs> I, I roll into work like 11. <laughs> like, I am not even awake by now. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>